Yeah. I never saw this until just recently. Acts chapter, when the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues of like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave utterance. Now, the cloven tongues of fire, I'm going to back up just a little bit. When Adam hid from the presence of God in the Garden of Eden, and said that he, he hid because he was naked, it was not because he lost his suit or clothing or whatever. It's because he lost the Shekinah that was the covering that enabled him to enter into the presence of God. That Shekinah that had been the covering that enabled him to enter the presence of God became a flaming sword to keep, the, to keep him away, to hinder rather than enable. Down through history in, in, in the Word of God, the burning bush that Moses stood before, and the dedication of the temple, of Solomon's temple, and the Mount of Transfiguration, that Shekinah. Shekinah is not a scriptural word, but it's a word that applies to the glory of God. It has to do with the glory that relates to us, that enables us to come into the greater glory of God, to abide without being consumed. Where we can literally come into the very presence of God and there's a covering that enables us to do that. That's Shekinah. Mm -hmm. This glory then descended as a friend on the day of Pentecost. It sat upon their heads and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now John the Baptist said this, He whose shoes I'm not worthy to unlatch, he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and in fire. fire. Since 1900, we have had and been receiving and experiencing and enjoying the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of fire is yet to happen. It has to do with the Shekinah, the glory being revealed, with the Lord presencing himself with his people. It sat upon their heads and they were filled. Now, I'm going to make kind of a strong statement. The glory is still sitting on our heads, waiting to come within. And I'll show you why. It hasn't come within. And there's an answer to this, and I don't have the full answer, but I think I have enough of it. Okay, Exodus chapter 19. Genesis, Exodus chapter 19. Verse 10. Exodus chapter 19, verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. The third day, we're at the end of the church age, the 2,000 years of the church age. We're approaching the millennial day, the day of the Lord. Be ready by the third day. For the third day, this is the Lord's day, when we make Him Lord, when we come to the end of ourselves. The first day, we commit our lives, we get saved. The second day, we consecrate. Our lives are cleansed, purged. We, the temple is made ready for the Lord. The third day, the Lord will come into the temple. That's in our personal experience. But corporately, we're, at, we're approaching the third day, the day of the Lord. Be ready by the third day, for the third day, the Lord will come down. Now, who has your Bible? Come down in what? The sight of what? In the sight of all the people. The Lord will come down. This is the Lord's desire to reveal his glory to everyone. He'll come down in the sight of all the people. Now, verse 16. It came to pass on the third day in the morning. This is the closing out of the second day, the birthing of the third. Thunders, lightnings, a thick cloud, the voice of a trumpet, so that all the people that were in the camp trembled. You see, physically, we cannot handle the presence of God. We have to be conditioned. We, as we're exposed, our capacity increases. Now, Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. 
And all the people saw the thunders, the lightning, the noise of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, that's visible glory. And when the people saw it, they backed up and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll hear, but let not God speak to us. In effect, this is what they said in present day terminology. They said, Moses, we don't want the glory of God. We do not want to come into the presence of God because we're not ready. Our lives are not ready, are not prepared. We don't want it. Moses, you go into the presence of God and come back and tell us what the Lord said. You can preach to us all you want. We can handle your preaching, but we can't handle the glory. Moses, we want a nice, dignified, liturgical service. We don't want to shake. We don't want to fall out of our chairs. We don't want to make funny sounds. That's our reaction to the glory. You can't help it. You see, we don't want these manifestations because they're embarrassing to the flesh. Moses, we want a nice, dignified, liturgical service where everything is in order. You go into the presence of God. And as, in other words, they rejected the Lord's desire was to come down, what? In the sight of what? All the people. So he withdrew into the Holy of Holies, where a high priest went once a year, to hear and come back out and make atonement for the people. Because the Lord was rejected by Israel. You see, the Lord's people now in the church, there has to be, and the Lord has checked us out, Toronto, in Florida, in different places. He, he, he kind of reveals, we've had touches here, we're going to have greater ones. And the Lord is checking us to see if we're available, if we're willing. You see, he was rejected, therefore he's not going to just come quickly. That's why it sat on their heads. The glory sat on their heads to see if they were willing, if he would be invited within. Remember when he walked on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples? When they came to the gate, he made as though he would go further. They compelled them, they invited them. He came within, he broke bread, their eyes were opened. But see, he made as though he would go further. And the Lord will check us. And if we're sensitive and alert, we'll respond to his presence, we'll open our being, we'll make room. And whatever happens. Now this is my definition of visitation. Visitation begins when the Lord begins to move in the body. In any meeting, when whoever's in the pulpit can sit down. See, visitation doesn't come from the pulpit, it comes from the Lord moving on the body. The head is going to be joined to the body. And when the Lord begins to move sovereignly on the body, visitation is beginning. And the Lord will test us to see if we're available. And in my heart of hearts, I have been blessed by, I've been involved in some I'll say heavy, I mean major visitations. And I have seen things that are scary to the natural man in the manifestations of God. I know what it is. Glory. And I'm believing for a tremendous visitation here. And literally, it will affect the nation. There isn't any program, any methodology, any great giftings of preaching or whatever. It's not going to do it. These million mile, or these million people things come and they go. And we go on. But what we need is visitation. We need the Lord. Above all. And it's got to come from a higher level. And all we can do is say, Lord, we're available. And these meetings, basically, the reason that these meetings were started years ago, in a very simple way, and I can remember back in the very beginning when we started, the intent was, Lord, we're available, we're here, but we're looking to you. We're believing for visitation. That's been my heart's desire. The only thing that I have in mind, that's the beginning and the end of it. We're here, an opportunity for the Lord to visit. The teaching, I trust the Lord for a word, for a present word. And I trust the Lord for good music, and we're blessed today, tremendously. The worship is beautiful. When we worship, principalities are affected tremendously. It will affect the whole city, this, this, this worship. The world doesn't know it, the church doesn't, hardly knows it. But worship tremendously affects the heavens. And when we begin to flow, the heavens will open. 
and the Lord will begin to move. Then we open our hearts and we move with it. And I'm believing for that. See, there's not, it's not just the Lord is waiting, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit, New Year's Eve, 1900, was either 1900 or 1901, beginning of the century, and it's, I, I've got to look that up, which day, but it doesn't matter. It was the beginning of this century. On New Year's Eve, the Lord began to pour out the Holy Spirit. One young lady received, the next day, several more. It spread to Azusa Street and around the world. But there was a time the fullness of time and I believe we're there and the Lord's going to begin to reveal now his glory he's going to begin to move on his people and this world's going to see a witness beyond anything that they've ever seen I believe some, he's going to do something very special right here in Washington DC and there's nicer places that where we could meet outside of the district but I believe we're supposed to be inside so we're just trusting for the right place the place of the Lord's choosing within the district and then whew, glory hallelujah Lord we're here and we're believing and we're asking visitation I believe the Lord is anxious and he's going to do it glory thank you Lord hallelujah now Lord we thank you and again we commit these meetings Lord we're here and we're looking Lord for visitation we're inviting you you're sitting upon us and we're welcoming you. We're asking you to come within. In a very special way, Lord, we're asking that you'll come within. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Lord, in a very special way. We ask, Lord, that we may hear from heaven. And this word, Lord, we ask that it might be personalized within each of us in a very special way that will be activated, released, that we can enter in to that which you're speaking, Lord, in this day. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I ask now, Lord, that we may have a hearing ear, a receptivity of spirit. And I ask, Lord, prophetic anointing that your word, quickened, anointed, will come forth and that it will accomplish your purpose, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> amen. Revelation. Adam? Yeah, I just felt the Lord um, <clears throat> was speaking. And he started speaking to me last night. He was speaking about hope and about faith and about what's going on. And he talked about um, what's going on, especially in the third world nations. And he said, when communism fell, there went the hope of many people throughout those worlds because their hope was that communism would succeed and then they would, everything would get great for them. But communism was poor because it's a man thing. And Islam and communism go hand in hand. And so what we're seeing right now is the rise of Islam in, the, in uh, Israel and throughout the world as it's trying to gain a grip. And I feel God wants to bring a visitation here and not a revival, but to go deeper, to make it a revolution inside us. So that the overcomer would come to bring hope to these people because people live even in America without hope anymore. We've got stuff, but we don't have hope anymore. But in our in, in Jesus we have hope. And with the overcomer comes a new hope of a new world. And I feel that's what he wants to do here. It's not something he's ever done before, but to make a habitation within us. And to bring the hope to the new world. Amen. Some time ago I received a very specific word from the Lord that we were to begin to pray and ask the Lord to visit the Ayatollahs of Islam, personally to visit them, that we would begin to pray to release the Lord. See, he moves through the body and that we were to begin to pray to release the Lord to visit the Ayatollahs. And just after that word came, about a week later, two weeks later, someone said, oh, did you hear what happened? They said, uh, well, Amullah in Iran was dying and Jesus appeared to him personally and made himself known and tremendously this man was converted and so I said thank you Lord that's just a confirmation to what you told me to pray and I believe it's important that we begin to pray that for again anything short of that is it, not going to make a change it's got to come from above and we need the intervention of the Lord in his presence amen glory Thank you, Lord. All right, chapter 4 and verse 1. 
After this I looked. John heard the knock on the door. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as the word of a trumpet talking with me. And this speaks of prophetic revelation. The voice of a trumpet is a human voice, but it's, it's a word that's giving direction. I believe that could be interpreted a present anointed word that's coming from the throne above. It's the word of the Lord. It's a call to action. It's a present word that comes directly from the Lord himself to his people under a heavy anointing. And the word was come up. And I've mentioned this, I believe, in whatever church, fellowship you attend, where there's the release of the prophet or the operation of the prophetic realm, a present word is going to come almost always. And it, somehow the content of that word is going to say what? Come up. See, it's a call up from the human, up into the heavenly. Man has had his day. We've had powerful personalities, ministries, giftings in the church, and they've not accomplished. And in a sense, the Lord is saying, now it's my turn. Glory. Hallelujah. And the Lord's going to begin to move. But in order to move, he has to have a place in which to move. Now, when Jesus was about to be born, the angel Gabriel came to a maiden, to a young lady named Mary, and said, the Lord has need of thee, or the Lord needs you, and proceeded to tell her what, what the intention was. And she said, simply, that's impossible. There's nothing in my life nor my circumstances that could allow that. I'm not married, I'm single, it's impossible. Well, that's all the Lord needed because... He needed a vessel, a channel, in which it was impossible. And so there was a womb that birthed. The Holy Ghost came upon Mary. That which was born was born of God. I just want to, this is sort of extra, but there's so much uh, running around today doctrinally that isn't right. Jesus... <clears throat> The word says the first Adam a living soul, the last Adam a quickening, a life-giving spirit. The first Adam, the last Adam. The Holy Spirit formed man from dust and breathed on man and he became a living soul. That's the creation of the Adam, the first Adam. We're born in the natural of the first Adam. Adam and Eve begot so-and-so, who begot so-and-so, who begot so-and-so, who begot you. That's each one of us. But when the Holy Spirit came to Mary through Gabriel, the Lord has need of thee. The dust now had shape and form, and that shape and form was named Mary. And the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came. God breathed on Adam and he became. The Holy Ghost moved on Mary. That which was born was born of God. So the word clearly says Mary, the mother of Jesus, whose husband was Joseph very carefully worded. The Father was the Holy Spirit. The blood comes from the Father. Therefore, the blood in the veins of Jesus was not, N-O-T, it was not Adamic blood. Jesus did not need to be saved. As Adam lost, he was born saved in a sense. Adam was born saved and lost it. Jesus was born, as it were, into this world. Perfect. And in the temptation, when Satan came to him, it was an attempt to break that down and defeat him. But he came out from the wilderness in total victory. The word says he was tested at every point like as we yet without sin. And as a perfect sacrifice, a lamb without spot or wrinkle, he died in our behalf. He shed righteous blood, not Adamic blood, but divine blood. It's very important, the deity of Christ in any cult, you'll find that breaks down. Jesus becomes less than that in any cult. And so there is that. Now, the Lord is gathering a people to himself today in a very special way. He's redeeming, purchasing a people to himself. That word, is, it's a present word that were to come up into his presence. He's preparing a people through he can move. Just as there was a womb 
in a young lady named Mary. Today there's a corporate war. See, a body of over a people who are being called together to make themselves available to the Lord. It's a corporate womb. And again, the Lord's going to breathe on that womb. And there's going to be a birthing of the corporate Jesus. Every eye will see him. Every knee will bow. That's the, that's the intent that, that will come. And there'll be that full outworking of the purpose of God. But it's a corporate womb. And the Lord is calling a people through whom he can begin to move. And the burden that I have is that there will be a people who will become available to the Lord. Just as Mary of old required a response on her part and the Holy Spirit came upon her. In other words, there was a divine activity specifically, uniquely taking place within Mary. And the result was Jesus, born as a baby. But this time he's coming back quite differently and we'll see it in a minute. When Jesus came, he came into the world as a baby. He grew in wisdom and stature. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He became the author of eternal salvation through his life of obedience to the Father. He said, I say, I speak, I do nothing of myself. He was victorious in his walk, his relationship. But, but when he comes back, it's not going to be a meek and lowly Jesus who suffered under the hands of mankind but there'll be a redemption a mighty redemption that'll take place within a body of overcomers and he's going to take his place as the head now we have a picture of that and we're just going to turn back about two pages revelation chapter one we have a picture verse 14 his head is hair this is not the picture of a baby by Jesus in the manger. But this is the picture of the Lord in the second return. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. His head, his hair were white like wool. That's full maturity. His eyes is a flame of fire. That's discernment. That's the gift of knowledge, wisdom, discernment. The eyes, he sees through the eyes of the body of us. And that's the giftings that we receive where we see beyond the human. His feet, like in the fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, that's the dealings of God when we're being reduced, when all that's a damage is being removed and we're being brought to a dependence upon the Lord. And that which is earthly is being chastened, corrected, dealt with. His feet, like in the fine brass as they burn in a furnace. His voice is the sound of what? Many walk. See, there's the corporate body. See, a corporate womb. Where the Lord's being birthed now in a body. So the Lord that's going to be revealed this time is not a very meek and lowly Jesus, but a Jesus that's fully mature, whose eyes are like a flame of fire and his feet like brass formed in fire. That's the Shekinah restored. The, and, and there's an authority. That means... That the word of knowledge, see, to him who overcomes will I give authority over the nations, and he'll rule them with what? A rod of iron. That's this picture right here, with the eyes as a flame of fire and feet like brass. That is a life that's dealt with with authority and power, in resurrection power being released through a people, an overcoming people. Now back to Revelation chapter 4. Come up. And I will show you things which must be hereafter. And I've been asking the Lord that for a couple of years now. Specifically, the Lord gave me that. Come up and I'll show you. And I said, Lord, you said it. Now, Lord, I'm asking. You said, come up and I'll show you. So, Lord, I'm coming apart and I'm asking. And all this that I'm sharing begin to unfold out of that prayer. Come up and I'll show you. And immediately I was where? In the spirit. There's the separation. And behold, a throne. Now, the church the church age relates to grace, forgiveness, the blood of Jesus, salvation, redemption. It relates to Christ within, Jesus being formed within our life. The kingdom is quite different. The kingdom relates to government. See, the church relates to grace. The kingdom relates to government. In the church, our goal is for the Lord to be formed where? Within our lives. Christ within. In the kingdom, our goal is Christ to be formed where? Upon. The government is what? 
on the shoulders. This is that adult head, hair white as wool, his eyes as a flame of fire. He's going to take his place right here. So this head has to go. Therefore, we present our bodies a living sacrifice. We're guillotined. I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. That's Jesus taking his place as the head. And when Paul said that, he had been in the heavens. He had seen, and seen things that were unspeakable. You see, this is a present word. That we give up our life, that he can live his life through our life. And so the result of giving up our life is not gloom and doom, but something glorious and tremendous. The, his eyes is the flame of fire. That divine authority is going to begin to touch our, us, our family, our home, our neighborhood, our city, and our nation. See, it's going to begin to spread out. And it's righteousness that begins within and begins to spread, which will result in peace and then great joy and all the earth will break out in singing because of divine government becoming effective. But first the government begins within. It has to be formed within. And the Lord's preparing now. So the word today is we give up the right to our own life. We make him the head because when this body is unveiled, all creation's groaning for this manifestation. It's not going to be a five foot eight Jesus like, you know, that was here the first time. I don't know how tall he was, but I don't know how to say. <laughs> but it's going to be a corporate Jesus, not because of television or mirrors or something. You know, it's not going to be that kind. You know, people wonder, well, how could he be seen everywhere? He can be seen because he's going to take his place as the head. As the sound of many waters, his life's going to be lived through each one of our lives. And that which is seen is not going to be us. It's going to be... The Lord. I struggled for years with this, the last part of Acts 1 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come, and ye shall be, not do, with ye shall be witnesses, and it says, witnesses unto me. Not a witness of me or a witness for me. It's a witness unto me. It took me years to sort that out. And the Lord said this as we witness unto him then we become so one with him. That's his prayer, that we become one. We become so one with him that his life is reflected through our lives. And that which is seen is Jesus. Therefore, I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. Why? Because it's Jesus revealing himself through my life. Now, that's powerful. If you get a hold of it, that is powerful. That This is a last day word. The world's going to see it. And I've been saying this. The world's been persecuting the church, laughing at the church, ridiculing it, persecuting. But they're in for a rude awakening. Because this Jesus, whose eyes are a flame of fire, his feet is brass formed in the fire. That means he's going to move in authority and power. With eyes as a flame of fire, the penetration, the word of knowledge, the understanding, the clarity of what's spoken. He's beginning to take his place as what? The head. As we submit this head, as we move it out of the way, and we make him Lord of our life, he's going to take his place, and the world's going to begin to increasingly, step upon step, here a little, there a little, line upon line, it's going to develop, it's going to grow like it's, in, it's beautifully expressed back in Daniel, about this kingdom beginning to expand and grow till it fills all the earth. And the Lord's beginning to reveal his power to take his place. He's looking for those like Mary of old, she said, I don't understand. It's impossible, but I'm available. Now, any one of us can say, I don't understand. It's impossible. And all we need to say is what? I'm available. That's it. I'm available. And that's what the Lord's looking for. A corporate body now, not a one single young lady, but now a corporate body. A bride that's going to give birth. Hallelujah. Glory in this day. Now, Immediately I was in the Spirit. Now verse 6 of Revelation chapter 4. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like into crystal. I just want to mention something about that. The sea of glass. The overcomers, the four living creatures, are, are in the midst in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures. These are New Testament overcomers. And they're pictured as being a sea of glass. 
Now, I've been praying this for months and doing a lot of heart searching in my life. See, the overcomers are before the Lord as a sea of glass. That means that our lives are what? Transparent. That means that everything within our life is like opening up our lives. Here it is. Read the book. That means that all those things that are hidden, that we wouldn't want to be seen, have got to be dealt with and put under the blood and, and cleansed. We need to be released from those things. They need to be dealt with. See, when the Lord's coming, he's going to lift this people and they're going to become as a sea of glass. And I've shared this in a meeting. And I said, when, when this takes place, we're going to be lifted and we're going to become like that sea of glass. Everything is going to be avail apparent. I said, now, are we ready? Everybody said, no, I'm not going. But see, the word says immediately I was where? In the spirit. Immediately. So that means we're in a time of preparation where the Lord's getting us ready that we can become as that sea of glass. See, where we'll become so transparent before the Lord that he can, that, that, that which is seen is Jesus, not us. Because we, the eye, becomes transparent. And that which is seen will be Jesus. To the extent that I'm transparent to that sea of glass is, is the extent to which Jesus will be revealed. And then he ascended in glory. Therefore, his glory is like a mirror. And in the reflection of that glory, he is seen. That's why Israel said, Moses, put a veil over your face. You, you can go in the glory. And when he came back, they said, Moses, you can preach all you want. You've got a clear channel from one ear to the other. We can handle your preaching. But we can't handle the glory. Why? The glory is like a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. And they didn't like what they saw. Because they're seeing themselves as they really were. And they said, no, no, Moses, we don't want. We can't handle that. Put a veil over your face. In other words, that there was not the sincerity of heart that was willing to be dealt with. The feet formed in fire, as brass formed in fire, means that we have submitted our lives to the dealings of God, to the deep inner workings of the Spirit of God. And the Lord is forming his very nature and his very life within us as the sea of glass, full of eyes. I've been saying this, and I'm looking for a greater confirmation. The overcomer, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. This is a present word. To him who overcomes will I give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with what? A rod of iron. That's a present word. Now I've been asking the Lord, in the context of the present, Lord, how does this apply right now? And what I'm getting is it's the word of knowledge with authority. In other words, you're going to begin to see things. See, judgment begins in the house of God. So we're going to begin to see things through the word of knowledge. Not to judge and criticize, but rather in compassion to bring restoration and life. It's how we handle it that's important. The Sermon in the Mount is the law of the kingdom. It deals with the issues of the heart. And so this word of knowledge, you see, this word, when this word comes, when we begin to see, and we can see things as they really are, there can come righteous judgment. The judgment of God always deals with restoration. It's always positive. The Lord judges to bring greater life. The enemy judges to bring condemnation and death. It's never meant to discourage. The judgment of the Lord is always intended to encourage and release us into a greater measure of life. Always. If it condemns and you say, it's no use, I may as well quit, you're hearing from the wrong source. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, these eyes before and behind in the midst of the throne, the four faces then, I want to come back to this and count. The four faces, the face of a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. We've been working on this about the last four meetings. We're going to stick with it for a while, another couple of meetings. The lion has to do with authority. You see, authority. The, but it's also the approbation of God resting upon a life. That, that, that authority, it's divine authority, not human authority, but divine authority. 
And when we come into a right relationship with the Lord, where the Lord is pleased, there comes that impartation of divine authority. In other words, divine substance within a life. Because we're being brought into the presence of the throne. The throne speaks of judgment, of righteousness. Therefore, the lion, that lion aspect has to do with authority, relationship, power. But it the, comes through the favor of God. It's not human power and authority, not personality, but rather it's the gifting of the Lord. The Lord reveals his greatest powers through the weaker vessel, the weakest vessels. By that I mean this, not through people with a strong personality and tremendous human giftings. But for that kind of a person, it takes a tremendous amount of reduction. See, Moses was mighty in word and deed. It took 40 years to get all that drained out of him. And we don't have 40 years. <laughs> but some of us <clears throat> some of us are blessed by being very limited. Now you would think that's not a, a blessing. Because most of us look in the mirror and say, poor me. You know, I don't have all these things that others have. Well, you're greatly blessed. Because that means the Lord could use you in a greater way. Because he's going to... See, Paul said, when I became the weakest, when I was the weakest, I became what? the strongest. It's in weakness that we're made strong. Because the Lord desires to reveal what? His glory. So it's in the weaker vessels, the untalented, the ungifted, common everyday people, that the Lord's going to reveal the greater glory. Not through a new breed of Benny Hinn's or Robert Cat. You know, these people with tremendous personalities, giftings, abilities. That day's over. He's, he's moving now in where? In the body. So then the lion, the lion has to do with authority, the approbation, the favor of God. Now I just want to say one thing about the favor of God, and I'll only get part way through this and we'll finish it next time because there's, I'm not going to hurry. And I'm only one third of the way. So, <clears throat> Revelation, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Philadelphia Philadelphia Greek word translated is phileo it's, it's a phileo that God's so called highest love is agape that's divine love God so agape so loved the world that he what he gave it's, it's, it's love, sacrificial love without expecting anything in return. It's one way out. Then there's phileo. I love you because you love me. See, it's love that responds to love. Then there's, there's eros, E-R-O-S, eros. That's not, that word's not in the Bible. That's the love of a salesman. He loves you to death until you buy something. <laughs> And the interest is not you, it's the commission that he's going to get. That's, that's, see, you love to give. So that's one way love in. See, that's one, that's the love of a salesman. He loves you to death until you buy. And then he's all done. Because he's, he's working for a commission. Well, that's all right, he's got to make a living. But that's eros. That word's not, then there's phileo. I, I, I love you because I'm responding to love towards, it's coming towards me from you. Then the agape. See, that's two way. Eros, one way in. Phileo, two way. Love responding. And then agape, one way out. See, so you got the lowest, one way in, two way, then one way out. Agape, the three words. We don't have that in English. So then, in English, the word phileo is meant is marital. It's 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 brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, so called, and so that's phileo. But in a sense, phileo is a love of the of, of the emotions. It's it, you know I've fallen in love. You like the human. You know it's 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 an emotional thing. Agape is the love of the will. So I can love I I can will to love you when I don't like you one bit. Have you ever had that feeling towards somebody? I don't like you, but I love you. Sure, you know what I mean. So we do it mental gymnastics. Say, well, I will to love you, but I don't like you one bit. 
So in that sense, if I say I like you, that's emotional. That means I really like you. And that includes the higher. So I, in, in a sense, phileo is higher than agape. Now I used to wonder, this church was in Philadelphia, or from the Greek sense, it was in phileo -ville. I thought if agape is God's highest love, why wasn't this church in agape -ville? See, it should have been in agape -ville if that's God's highest. Because there's something interesting about this church. To the church, this is Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. The angel of the church in Philadelphia writes, These things saith he that's holy, he that's true, he that hath the king of, the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Now that's powerful. That's the favor of God resting on a life. When you're in that relationship, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. And I, I will make them, verse 9, of the synagogue of Satan, I'll make them to come and worship before your feet. That means the Lord will make even your enemies to bow before you. Now that is divine favor resting on a light. That's approbation. It has to do with phileo. That means when we, with a single heart, not we say, Lord, I love you in my will, but I love you in my heart. See, it's a genuine love where, Lord, I love you. And the Lord will respond to that. And he'll set before us an open door. That's a, this is a life committed to a love relationship with the Lord. It's a powerful thing. It's tremendously powerful. And it has to do with divine favor. I've set before thee an open door. That means the Lord will make a way where there is no way. Because he has the keys. He can open. And no man can shut. He will make a way. And you know, when we come into that level of divine relationship, where, where there's that love is genuine within the heart, not in the will, not a Sunday morning love, but something within our heart of hearts where we're giving expression of a genuine love relationship to the Lord. When we've made him Lord, we've settled the problem, we've yielded our lives, we've given up all the things that we'd like to have and do and all this. And we just said, Lord, if they ever happen, it's in your hand. And you know, I've learned something. I've lived a while. And I have learned, because I have got mad at the Lord, because there were some things that I thought. And I, th I can look back and thank the Lord that he did not give me what I wanted. I can rejoice and thank him. And I've come to realize that what the Lord had for me was infinitely better than anything that I was trying to convince him to do. You know what I mean, convince them to do? Because <laughs> we all do that. Well, I thank the Lord he didn't give in. Because I've looked back. Because what he had, see, it's our Father. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father. If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things to them that love him? L-O-V-E, the love. Phileo. See, that's a consuming love that love him. And see, good things. He knows far better than we. A child, a young child, most of them, would live on candy if you'd let them. <laughs> I wouldn't mind eating ice cream three meals a day, seven days a week. I like it. I really like ice cream. But I, but I know better. <laughs> I, I don't do it. Because <laughs> I know better. See, and the Lord knows a lot better than we know. There's a few things we know, but the Lord knows a lot more. <laughs> Glory. See, and I eat ice cream seven days a week, but I know better. Well, the Lord knows a lot more than that. And when I submit to him, I gain infinitely. In my life, what might have, what, what, what could be, what I could be doing. And I've shared this, you've all heard it, and the people at the Bible school, if I say July the 4th, 1959, they all laugh. And I've had people say, say, are we ever glad that you turned around? But I had it all worked out. July the 4th, 1959, I loaded the family in the car. I was on my way to Philadelphia to rent a storefront on Stenton Avenue in North Central Philly. And I was going to start a church. Had it all worked out. The pastor had arranged for him to help me. 
the Lord stopped me and told me to go to a place called Pinecrest. I'd never been there in upstate New York. It was owned by the Italian branch of the Assemblies of God. Its stated purpose was to train the younger Italian generation to preach the gospel in the Italian language. And I knew that, I had heard it, but I thought, I don't know what I am, but there's one thing I know. I am not Italian, and I don't want to preach to Italians in the Italian language. And I just pushed it off. But the Lord said, Pinecrest. So we went up, and I got alone that night. And the Lord said, for the hardness of your heart, as clear as I'm talking to you, one of the clearest I've ever heard, the Lord said, for the hardness of your heart. Now, why would he say that? Answer. I'm listening to what? My head. I'm looking at Italians. <laughs> Literally. Instead of the Lord. I will let you go to Philadelphia, and I'll give you ministry there and bless it. But this is where I want you. Didn't make a bit of sense. Philadelphia made a lot of sense. Fortunately, I went to Pinecrest. I wouldn't be, if I hadn't, I would have a nice church in Philadelphia. I would be a pastor. I would not have the ministry I have. I would not know what I know. I would be in an entirely different environment. My whole life would have been totally different. There would have been no Bible school. That school was open for three years closed. Years later, I could write a book on how it happened. The Lord gave me the deed to that property. And there was a Bible school, and I was there for 30 years. That touched thousands of lives. None of that would have happened. But it didn't make a bit of sense to my head. It was contrary to everything I'd see. I'll set before thee an open door, and what? No one. I could write a book on how I got the deed to that property. The Lord made a way. But see, to back up, I had met the Lord in a very unusual way through a major visitation. I love them that what? that love me. Now that's subjective. That's not objective. That's subjective. And that deals with the Lord becoming singularly active within our lives. It has to do with the divine activity within our lives. I love them that love me. So then, there's that, that relationship. It deals with authority. But that authority comes out of the favor of God, the lion. It's not a human strength and boldness, but rather it's submission, making him Lord and allowing his strength, his life, that hair white as wool, the divine wisdom, the authority, the power and resurrection, seated at the right hand of power, feet as, 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 as a flame of fire. He's got an authority that he can move. You see, when I identify with him in that, there comes an, a divine authority, a substance, a divine substance, and something will become resident in your life that others will sense that God lives within your life and that there's an authority and when you speak things happen that's a powerful thing and when you see that it beginning to happen in the lives of others there's a release and a sense of satisfaction that from nothing that you could do or have would ever satisfy that I I was in the army 1943 to 45 I got drafted and I was totally frustrated had a dream of having my own business. In a very unusual way, the Lord gave it. And I ended up with a very successful business. I was making a lot of money. And in the sense of this world, I owned a TV cable system and a general insurance agency. Nobody knew, this was back in the 1950s, and no one knew how successful cable systems would have been. But I sold it. The man I sold it to became a millionaire several times over. And I had all of that. And I sat there absolutely miserable. And I thought there's, because that was it, I thought. And here I am with it, and there was an emptiness. And something, there was no satisfaction. The cash register was ringing, it was like owning a public utility. Either hooked up or went without. And people wanted television. And I had success, but emptiness. And I knew it, and I struggled with it. And I wouldn't trade, people say you, that you gave up a lot. I didn't give up anything. I gained 10,000 times. And I thank the Lord for that. And so the Lord was just tremendously good. And I thank the Lord that I could do that. But I, when I sold it, I had all my bills paid and I had enough money to live on for six years. And I was able to go through the dealings of God. The Lord told me how much to sell the business for. And I ran out of money right when I was supposed to. It was just amazing. And, and the Lord just moved. You see, there's the sense of God 
taking control within our lives and bringing us into that which he has for us. So that lion aspect. Now one more and then we're going to finish. And then we'll pick it up from there. The calf. See, the lion deals in authority. And that authority comes through relationship, through the submission of our lives. The face of a lion, the face of a calf. We spent time on these the last couple of meetings. But just one more thing on each of these. The lion deals with authority. The calf with dependence, helplessness. Because the Lord desires to reveal his glory and his power through us. Not human power, but divine power through, him, through the human. When Satan deceived Adam and Eve, he laughed at God. He said, now I've wrecked your purpose. And the Lord said, you may have bruised their feet, but they are going to bruise your head. Remember that? The Lord, through, through, through man, deceived man, is going to redeem out of from amongst mankind a people that he's going to train, prepare, make ready, and that people, that people are going to bring Satan down. He's going to do it, not a, not a five foot eight Jesus, but he's going to do it through a body of overcomers. See, he's preparing a people. That's the ultimate insult to Satan. The very fact that the very ones that he deceived are the ones that are going to do him in. And so the Lord is preparing a people. But it's not in our power. See, we can't cope with, 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 with principalities. But the Lord can. But he's going to do it the reason he has it. Is, I've often said, Lord, why don't you zap the devil? Life would be so much nicer. He said, I'm not going to do it. You're to do it. He's going to do it through the human. See, because that's the principle. He's going to do it through mankind. He's waiting for a people that will come into a place of authority that will begin to do it. And it will be accomplished for every knee will bow and every tongue proclaim. So he's going to do it. But he's going to do it through a redeemed people. Now, the calf. The calf deals with dependence. And just one thing, and then we'll start with this next time, because I'm going to spend more time on this. I'll just give you one principle, and we're going to stop. Matthew chapter 5, the calf, that place of dependence. Matthew chapter 5. And I want to spend a little more time on this, and we're going to pick it up. We're going to start right here next month. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 3, blessed are what? The poor, not the mighty, the great, the intelligent, the gifted, the talented, but blessed are what? The poor. Now, if you do anything in Greek, I'll, I'll tell you, but you can look this up and verify. There's two words in the Greek language for poor. There's the word that applies to most of us. We don't have as much as we would like to have. So we would consider ourselves poor because there's a lot we'd like to do, but we can't. So we'd say we're poor. There's another word for poor. And this word deals with abject poverty. Having absolutely nothing. We don't even, can't even comprehend what that means to relate to it. We can't even begin to, to be stripped down to absolutely nothing. I mean, everything gone. That's abject poverty. That's the word that's here. Blessed are the poor, blessed are they that have been utterly stripped. Now that the Lord's intention is not to do that in material things. He took Job through this as a lesson. Job was reduced, and he came to this place. He sat on an ash heap with boils, and this word would apply to Job in that condition. And that was as a lesson for us. And the Lord's intention is not to do that. But if we will submit our lives unconditionally to the Lord and we want his best, and if that is necessary, see, the Lord will not, there's a word in the Old Testament about the plowman and then the reaper. And there's, there is a, I, I'm not a farmer, I don't know the word, but there's a thrashing machine that prepares the wheat to be harvested. Sort of a, a a columbine or something like that and the word was that you sort of beat it but he will not thrash it or beat it beyond, only to the necessary extent not beyond that to accomplish the purpose that's a that that is a divine promise that he we will not be disciplined chastened reduced beyond that which is necessary and but if we'll give the lord permission 
he'll reduce us to the extent that's necessary that his glory can be more fully received. The greater the reduction of the human, the greater the manifestation of the power of God, of the very person of the Lord reflected through our lives. It's to the extent that I die that he can live. See, I'm crucified. Therefore, I can, I can begin to mourn and look at the grave and measures, and check how dead I am and rejoice in how dead I am. See, I got set free from all that. A lady named, a pastor, her name was Hattie Hammond, years ago. She died several years ago. She was 95 when she passed away. Back in the 1950s, I heard a message. And she said, Behold the lily. Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. I'll never forget, she said, that lily, that beautiful lily is there, but in the ground underneath it is a bulb that's dying, that's rotting, and the life of the lily is coming out of that bulb. And she said, the Lord never said, behold the bulb, how dead it is, and how willingly it's dying. Behold the bulb. He didn't say that. He said, what, behold what? the lily. That set me free from a multitude of things. You know, from a casket mentality. Trying to measure how dead I am. <laughs> That'll all take care of itself. It's not behold the bulb. Behold how dead I am. It's behold what? The lily. Solomon, all of his glory. is not arrayed like one of these. So life comes out of death and the Lord rejoices not in the death but in the life that results. And so he's doing a tremendous work within our lives. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom, not salvation. This has nothing to do with salvation. For theirs is what? The kingdom. That has to do with authority, with power, with ruling. For theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are they that mourn. When you're being reduced, you can't help it. You're going to mourn. So in all that you go through in that process of reduction, the Lord is saying you're blessed. Because, see, you've got a goal. You've got a purpose. And your goal, see, I am crucified. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. See, the goal is the life of the Lord to live through my life. So I give my life. That's martyrdom, spiritual. The Lord's not looking for dead martyrs. He's looking for living martyrs. Yes. <laughs> Therefore, as I submit, as I allow the Lord to take me through this process, Blessed are they that mourn. Or said, you're, you're going to, you can't help it. The law of self-preservation is powerful. And you've got to work your way through it. The Lord has got a lot of patience. Peter, by trade, was what? A fisherman. What was Jesus by trade? Carpenter. Do you know why? Because he, he, he was learning how to make crosses. <laughs> See, for each one of us. Take up what? Not Calvary's cross. Take up what? your cross and there's one for each one of us that'll accomplish that'll bring that reduction what'll work for you won't work for me see what i need may what i need may be horrible for me and, and you'd and you'd laugh at it but the lord knows he knows how to make a cross for each one of us so then blessed are they that mourn and then the result blessed are the meek that meekness is the result of a yielded life that's mary be it unto me according to thy purpose. The Holy Ghost came upon her. That which was born was born of the Holy Spirit. It, it's a life that's totally yielded to the purpose of God. It's a meekness. There's a strength in that. But it's a yielded life. For they shall inherit what? The earth. That's powerful. And the Lord's raising up a people that's going to bring down. Right now principalities and powers are in control of the nations. But that's going to come to an end. And it's going to come to an end through a people that have allowed the Lord to deal with them. Common, everyday people that allow the Lord to bring an authority within. That the, that the lamb spirit now will become a lion. Just as Jesus came as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion. And he's preparing a people that will enter in, become a part of that which he's about to do. And by the grace of God, hallelujah, see we're going to become a part of that which the Lord's doing in the earth. He's preparing a people. And I'm believing that as we enter in, as we worship, as we flow, visitation 
is like, is like plowing the soil. It loosens us up, opens us, makes us trust, we, we recognize, and then the Lord will move through that into our lives. When visitation fails in its purpose, it ends with, with us feeling good rather than preparing the soil of our heart for a deeper and a greater work that we can go further and beyond that. So the Lord's doing a beautiful work. So next month, we're going to pick up where we left off and we're going to start with the with the, with the, the lion, the lamb, and then we'll work down through a little more. Okay, let's all stand together. We're going to pray. Then after we pray, those that would like prayer, I'll pray with you. If you'd like, there's soda, refreshments, there's donuts. Stay in fellowship, some talk. Be sure you get some, some real nice stuff back there to drink. It's been prayed over, so it's harmless. And the donuts, <clears throat> and just fellowship. Amen. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your people, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for that which you're doing in this day. Help us to hear, to be prepared, to be made ready. Prepare, Lord, a people in this day. And Lord, we're asking about the place where you'd have us meet. That in your time and way that it will surface, that we'll know. And we thank you for your provision. And now, Lord, we lift up this people believing and asking that we as Mary of old will become that womb for the birthing of your purpose in the earth in this hour and this day. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, and Lord willing, we'll see you all the second Saturday of November. Amen. And if you like prayer, we're here. Are you making this tape available? To, are you making copies of this tape? Yeah, it'll be available.